Well, if you have your Bible, we're going to turn to John chapter 12. John 12, we're going to be looking at verses uh, 27 through, uh, through 34 this morning. John chapter 12, uh, verses 27 through, through 34. You know, a um, kind of a, a image or a a, a trademarked logo is um, is very important. It's really uh, um, um, uh, if you were to go to an advertising agency and to ask them to develop their um, you know marketing plan, one you're going to spend quite a bit of, of money in, in doing so. In fact, I don't know if you saw the the news quite recently, but the uh, University of Kentucky has sued. The Commonwealth of Kentucky, with which they are kind of the same, but I guess different, uh, because the Commonwealth of Kentucky, we've been using the, the, the Team Kentucky, and the claim by the university is, well, people will be confused to thinking that when we're referring to the state of Team Kentucky, that we're thinking it's, it's the University of Kentucky. Now, uh, well, as they say, you can sue for anything. I can't imagine uh, that that is how that's going to turn out. But, but it shows you the, the importance of of what a an image would would communicate. And so, you know, if you see an image like this, what what would that Right, Facebook. Yes, Facebook. What about this one, Brendan? What do you think about this one here? <laughs> McDonald's. Uh, yes, yeah, Mc, McDonald's. And for our uh, more uh, sophisticated folk, we are at some point getting a Starbucks in the uh, new Kroger that's coming. So, yes, yes. And, and we notice that none of these have words in there, but. But because of 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 the, the what uh, the emphasis the the time the the money though that that went into it, we are bombarded with these images to know what it is, not just uh, what it is, but uh, but what they what they represent. But there may be uh, no symbol that, that for for the, the the time of history that has had a greater impact on society than than this one. It's a cross, right? A cross. People wear them around their their neck, or now you see people get tattoos of a cross on their uh, on their on their uh, body, or we uh, and we, we we see it in some because it's a fashion statement. But we as Christians know that the cross is really it's a a a death chamber. Right? The purpose of the cross is to to put people to. To death, but we're going to see this morning that the cross, the, ir- the irony of, of an instrument that is used for death was able to accomplish what the people that put Jesus to death on that cross never intended. And so we're going to see three things through the cross this morning. We're going to see that there is glory in the cross. We're going to see that there is also judgment in the cross. But we're lastly going to see that there is life in the cross. So let's read here John chapter uh, 12, uh, beginning in verse uh, 27, as we see, there is glory in the cross. And we read, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Uh, Father, save me from this hour, but, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and, and heard, it, as that, heard it said that, that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. But Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now we see that Jesus is, was troubled. Now, why would Jesus be troubled? What was causing him great Great a- anguish. Was he, was he troubled here over what was to come in the sense of knowing the, the pain and the suffering that he was uh, going to in, endure? And I mean, that may have been on his, his, his mind, but, 
But look, he kind of, you know, posed this as a question. You know, he says, what shall I say, Father, that, that you would save me from this hour? Now, to be honest, if I was probably in the position of Jesus, yeah, that would be what I would say. Look, God, I, I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to die. Please spare me from, from the pain and suffering. But Jesus, he didn't say that. No, he, he said, this is the purpose that I came. I have come to this, this hour. I mean, that, that's why Jesus came. He came to die. And we see that Jesus' ultimate purpose was to glorify was to glorify God. All right, look here, what, what he says, he says, and, then, and so God in his response says that I have glorified it. All right, I have glorified it and not just that, but I will glorify it again. See, Jesus glorified God the Father through his life on earth through his being born as, a, as an infant and, and growing up to his first time, we see when he is in that temple and he's able to teach like no one ever had. God was glorified when Jesus went to the, the needy, the broken, the hurting. When he healed those who had lifelong incurable diseases. When he performed great miracles like feeding the, the 5,000. But God was also glorified in the future, then, in the past, now, through the death of Jesus. I think, uh, well, how in the world could, would, would something so horrible and, and so, uh, so just uh, devastating, how could that bring glory to, to anyone? What is, what is our purpose in life? I mean, I mean, you ever think about, you know, sometimes kind of things that keep you up at night, just like big, big I mean, what is, why am I here? Why am I here? And if you're kind of like, why in the world would God choose to put me here right in 2021? <laughs> I mean, is our purpose, our ultimate purpose to be a, a good father or mother? Is it to be a successful in our career or or to, 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 to have, you know, all of the, the comforts and, the, uh, and the, the pleasures of the world. No, that's not that those are bad things. But our ultimate purpose on earth is the exact same of, of Jesus. It is to, it's to glorify God. Now, how are we to, to do that? Well, we, we do that. By going back to what uh, here it says that last, last week we, we saw Jesus saying that if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am there, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, what the Father will honor him. See, we glorify God by following the Son. Right, we, we, we glorify God by, by following, by being his servant. And so the way that we bring glory to God is, is not being the best version of ourselves, but it is aligning ourselves, being as close as we can to, to the Son of God. You know, I saw this past week, a, a tweet from uh, Pastor Tim Keller, and he said this. He said that it's always God's prerogative to rearrange your schedule. And he's like, I'm relearning that over again. Someone who has retired from uh, the pulpit, it, it's a lesson that we continuously must learn. Anybody like to, uh, to have a schedule, to have a timeline, I mean, how often, you know, we're, we're going out to eat and we find that, you know, there's a disruption, whether it's because of, you know, it, uh, there's too many people there or there's not enough help and we have to, we get interrupted. And I mean, did any of us get excited about, about that? No, <laughs> not at all. 
But sometimes when we see these disruptions in our life, whether it's just something that's been taken away from us, or if it's something that we should, um, that we should, uh, you know, be doing, but we're hesitant to, to do is remember this, that if we want to glorify God, we are to be servants of the son. And in being servants of the Son, we must submit not just part of ourselves, but our entire lives to, to Him. And, and the servant does not get to dictate to the Master what he or she gets to do. So always... Realize that it is God's prerogative to rearrange our schedule. And this is the, the amazing thing about it is we, we, we see this as, as almost like an act of punishment or, or something that, that is, um, uh, that, that, that's just, just seeking to harm us. But the best place for us to be is exactly where God wants us. And we, we don't do it on our own. We do it through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside each and every one of us. And so when, when our life gets interrupted, whatever that, that looks like, we, 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 we tend to, to, to blame. We may blame a God for why did this have to happen to me? We may blame other people. And some, we might even just blame the dog or the cat that had nothing to do with it, but they're just, they're easy to blame. But the lesson just that I'm learning just as Tim Keller is, and probably you are too, is to not see the disruptions in our lives as punitive, as things to get us down. But look, first and and foremost, look, God, how are you going to use this for your glory? How are you going to, how are you going to use this for your glory? Now, another interesting thing in these uh, few verses that we, we just, um, we just read is that, that how it was that, that God relayed this information to those that were there. You see, we, God spoke audibly, all right? It wasn't a, a, the, the still small whisper. No, in fact, as we, uh, as we, we, we see here, it said the crowd stood there, they heard it, and they said, what? That it had thundered. Others said that an angel has spoken to him. Now, this is the, the, the third time that we have recorded in the New Testament of God audibly speaking to the people. The first one, if you remember back to when John the Baptist baptized his cousin Jesus, the heavens opened up and God said, this is my son in whom I'm, I'm well pleased. The second is at the transfigure, transfiguration when, when uh, Jesus takes his closest disciples up to the mount in the transfiguration and, and God speaks. But here God speaks among the crowd. Now, uh, why did he speak? Did he speak to just to show how powerful he was? Was it for Jesus? No, obviously not for For Jesus says, look, the voice, meaning God, has come for your sake, not for mine. I mean, why why would God need to speak for Jesus when he is is God? He is one with God. So God is the one. He spoke for the people's sake and true as a way of of, of, for for us. and, And today he speaks for our sake too. You know, a lot of times we, when we, find God is speaking, whether that is audibly, like maybe we see here in this passage, or maybe we just see circumstances line up, is that we, we, we try to find just natural solutions for, for really what is supernatural. Right? And that's what, that's what the, 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 the people that were there with Jesus did, right? They, they, they heard God speak, and they're like, well, obviously we can't, you know, I mean, you can't hear things from the heavens, so it must be, be some type of thunder. And we just kind of interpreted that to being that God is speaking. But a caution for us is to be careful not to, to try to rationalize, to try to uh, kind of bring the supernatural down to, to our level. But instead may we trust in, in the God and 
understand that there are things that we just don't understand. We cannot comprehend that are at work. But know this, that if it is from God, you will know. All right, because God is the God of, of clarity, right? The enemy is the author of confusion. All right, now, I believe in spiritual warfare. <laughs> there may be times the, the enemy speaks to you and can kind of, kind of mimic a God, but, but listen, the, when God speaks, you will know if you are listening. Now, again, another point of caution in this is that if God does speak, but yet it contradicts the word of God, that's a pretty good sign that it's not God doing the speaking. All right, so we should test everything by, by the word of God. But may we not, you know, and not push out the, the things of God because of one, it may, it may be a little weird. Other people might think, oh, you're just one of them, you know, crazy Jesus people. Or, or maybe it's out of fear. It's like, oh, you mean I need to go follow? So if I just don't, if I pretend that it didn't happen, then I don't have to do it. And then, you know, while well, you said, you know, if God's speaking, don't just dismiss it as having indigestion at night, okay? <laughs> May we listen to God for, for God is glorified in the cross. But second, there is a judgment in the cross. We see here in verses 31 through 33, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. We don't really like to talk about judgment much, but it is reality. And honestly, we, we do. It just, it's how we, we, we talk about it. We, anybody pray that the, you know, the ISIS K or whatever they're called, or the Taliban receives the judgment that they deserve. Absolutely. Absolutely. But friends, we all deserve judgment. In fact, that is what the cross does is it judges. See, for those who trust in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, we are judged. But we are judged righteous. Not based on anything we've done, but based on Jesus. For when Jesus was hanging on that cross, when he died, when the curtain was torn in two and the, the earth quaked and Jesus took the judgment that we all deserve. He took our sin on himself and bore that. But he defeated sin and death by rising from the grave on the third day. And so we are judged and not based on our goodness or our badness, but we're based solely on our faith and trust in Jesus. But for those who who have not trusted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Bible tells us that you are condemned to an eternity in hell. I mean, take a moment, let that just kind of sink in for a moment. One, if we are saved, oh, the, the beauty and the goodness of that. But if we're not, imagine what eternity is going to be like. And we also see the urgency that, that Jesus is speaking. He said, now, he keeps saying, now is the time. Now is the time that the, the, the ruler of this world is, is Satan. So ultimately God, Jesus, through Jesus, is, is, is judging Satan. Now, while Satan still has a, a little power on earth, and now he is uh, nothing compared to God, and there will be a day when, when he will stomp on the heel, or stomp on the head of that serpent. And he will be cast into the lake of the fire with all of his, all of his minions. But we also see that, that God is drawing all people to himself. Now, be careful in how we say this. Some might think, oh, so that means that God is love is to save every, 
everybody. Everybody will be saved. And that's, that's not what we're, Jesus is, is saying here for that would mean universalism that no one needs to trust him because you don't need to worry about that because, Hey, everybody's good. No, what, what Jesus is saying here is that, is that people from every tribe, nation, and tongue will be saved, be in heaven. And that's because God deserves the worship of all people. Not just those of us in, in the United States of America, but that includes those in Afghanistan or in Nigeria or in Iraq or Brazil or you name it. Heaven, as the word tells us, is that, is that it will be a place of great diversity where there will be people of every nation, tribe, and tongue. And so God, through Jesus, is drawing all people to himself. And this is, you know, very important, especially to the hearers of this, because salvation up until this point was for the Jews. But Jesus is saying it's not just for the Jews now, it's for the Gentiles for all people. And so that's why we as a, a, a church see the importance of, of praying, of giving and going to the ends of the earth so that, so that everyone has the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and to respond in faith and trust. So there is judgment in the cross, but lastly, we see that there is life in in the cross. Look here, verses 34 through 36. It said, so the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that, that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? All right, who is this son of man? And so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. So walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Now, the people that are here with Jesus, they, they, they just could not understand. It just wasn't making sense to them what, what Jesus is saying. For they had been taught from the, the, the time that they were a little through generations that, that the Son of Man will, will live forever. And Jesus is saying, yes, that's correct. But the Son of Man will live forever through, through dying. Now, it was, would be an impossibility for a, an ordinary person, for we do not die and come back to life. But for Jesus, he defeated death. And that's why the cross is essential to not just our salvation, but it's essential to everything that we experience in, in the world and, and the hope that we have what is to come. For as Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, if there is no resurrection, then we are still dead in our sins and we should be pitied more than anyone. But there was a bodily resurrection Jesus defeated sin and death by rising from the grave and through his victory, it is our victory as well. And so Jesus is, 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 is telling in a word of, of, of caution, urgency, but also in, in a sense of hope. And, and, and he's saying that, yes, Guys, the, the light is among you. We know John uses this imagery of, uh, of light and darkness, meaning Jesus is, and he says, you need to walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. For the one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. And I think sometimes we, as, as the, the church, and particularly the American church, we've kind of lost the urgency of the gospel. And, you know, as I said earlier in our service, it's kind of this, this, to, to, to take in the moment where we are right now. 
because today is never going to happen again. That could be a good thing. <laughs> Maybe it's going to be a bad day and you don't want to experience <laughs> But it's going to be a bad thing. And I was talking with someone the other day. And again, they were talking about, you know, in their years, they never would have imagined that there would be a point in time in their life where they would not be in church. Obviously, he said, we would never choose that. But because of health conditions and sickness, they, it's been removed. And, and they realize how much they miss it, how much they, how much they need it. And our hearts breaks for those in that position. And so one, we, we grieve with them as we are in the family of God, but, but also may we not take the gifts that are given to us. And friend, each day is a gift for we do not know what tomorrow will bring. And so may we cherish every opportunity that we get. May we not say, well, you know, I got in, you know, coming into the, the, the church is, you know, what? I'll just, we miss it. That's okay. We'll just pick it up again next week. And I mean, we can do for, I mean, for the most part, um, you know, it, you know, unless something crazy happens, we're going to be here having church next Sunday, but you're not going to be able to experience today. You're not going to be able to experience it. And so may we want take advantage of the gifts that God has uh, given us, but also may we bear the burden of those that, that aren't. But, but while that's true here in this, I think it's even, uh, the stakes are even higher for, for sal salvation. And that's what Jesus is, is getting at here. He says, look, you guys, <laughs> you are walking with, the very one who can save you being Jesus. And he says, I'm just going to be here a little while longer. And he said, so while you're with the light, our time is, is, is short. So look, you need to, you need to trust in, in the light. So for two groups of people, one, for those that are not saved, you are walking in darkness. And what's sad and interesting is that most of the time they don't realize it. Um, but just last night I was uh, coming over to, to the church and there was, as we have several that uh, walked through the, uh, the, the parking lot, this person was obviously uh, <laughs> um, struggling to walk, not health reasons, but for other, uh, well, somewhat um, self-caused health reasons. And, uh, I was just stumbling, spilling drink here and, and, and there. And I reached to see, are you all right? And he kept on going. And I kind of watched him to make sure that he was not going to cause harm to himself or anybody else. And um, I don't know who he is, but uh, you know, some of that, that in his mind probably didn't realize that there is anything off anything wrong. And that's usually when we're, you know, when we're consumed by the, the darkness is honestly, that's just kind of normal. That's reality. But in a spiritual sense, when we have experienced the light, we can see darkness. Right? We should, we, we're able to discern righteousness from unrighteousness. And so we don't, we don't abuse that in a, in a condemning way, but what we are to call to do is we are to, to tell them, Hey friend, there's another way. You don't have to live this way. No, for he there is life in, in Christ, not just life for the here and now, but eternal life. And we are also to warn them of the, the continuing path of uh, destruction. Again, not for what substances can do to our body, but you could be the best, uh, most upstanding person in society and, and end up in hell. So the hope in Jesus and the desperation of Hell, but the good news for us as followers of Christ and also uh, those that are in the darkness is that we are just called to be sharers of the good news. 
We are to invite others into the relationship with, with Jesus, for he is the one that draws people to himself. He is the one that brings the dead to life, that opens the eyes of the blind, both physically and, and spiritually. And so for us, that if you are not in Christ, may when you hear God speak, and maybe you're just not sure, maybe you're, you know, your mind, you're playing game, you're thinking, okay, well, no. If God is telling you to follow him, that's not Satan. <laughs> that's not, that's not Satan. No, what Satan's going to do is say, all right, you know, if you do this, then man, people are going to make fun of you. You know what you may, you know, we're in this, you know, a PC culture. So you might lose your job or might get overlooked. He's going to give you all the reasons why you shouldn't follow Jesus. But know this, whatever lies or spew to you, God, you, you can overcome not through our power, but by aligning ourselves with the light of the world. So there's glory in the cross. There is judgment in the cross and there is life in the cross. Would you pray with me?